Good evening. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles together to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> We'll begin reading in verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now those words were penned 2,000 years ago. And so, and this is God's word, I remind you. If God said, yet a little while, and he that shall come will come 2,000 years ago, then... It's much more, much less of a little while now, isn't it? <clears throat> now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. We don't believe what the world believes about creation. We believe that God spoke and things came to be. <clears throat> by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Remember, Abel's sacrifice was a blood sacrifice, and Cain was the labor of his hands, by which he, speaking of Abel, obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. Let's pray together. Our glorious and merciful Heavenly Father, how hopeful we are that the Lord Jesus Christ will be crowned in our hearts tonight, that you will increase our faith, that you will send your spirit and power and enable us to, to rest all our hopes in him, to look to him and for him. Lord, that you would restrain the sin of our flesh and that you would keep us in Christ and Lord that you would forgive us for Christ's sake for our many expressions of unbelief Lord we are in need of your mercy we're in need of your grace we've come here tonight with hopes of worshiping you we ask Lord that you would enable us to do just that. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together once again and we'll sing hymn number 336 from the hardback hymnal. 336. <clears throat> So shall my 
walk, be close with God. Calm and serene, my frame, so purer light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. Please be seated. Open your Bibles again with me, please, to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I've titled this message, Nothing Doubting. Nothing Doubting. I started to title it, Lord, Help Thou Mine Unbelief. But these words are here in our text. We'll read them together, beginning in verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Holy Spirit said to Peter, don't doubt, go. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. The sin that doth so easily beset us, the fountain of all sin, and the root cause of all our problems is the sin of unbelief. And we can all say with that dear father pleading for his child, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Every believer struggles with the unbelief of his own flesh. And uh, in our text tonight, the Lord has given us four things to help us, to help us overcome this, uh, this sin of unbelief. And I think you'll find them very encouraging as we, as we look at them together. I was thinking about 2 Samuel chapter 12 when Nathan, you remember, confronted David over his um, murder of, of um, uh, Bathsheba's husband and, and adultery with her. And... Um, And Nathan gave David this scenario about a man who had stolen his neighbor's uh, lamb. And David became enraged and and said he should be put to death and he has to pay threefold for what he's done. And, And that's when Nathan said, David, you're the man. You're the man. And, uh, and Nathan told David, he said, you know, David, and he reminded, if you go back to second Samuel 12, uh, he, he told David all the things that God had given him. He rehearsed all the blessings that he had enjoyed of the Lord, inheriting the throne and Saul's household and all the goods. And, and then Nathan said this. Nathan said, and if that wasn't enough, God would have given you more. <laughs> and yet David's unbelief, his lack of trust and satisfaction and things that God had given him, just like us, caused him to look outside of God and outside of Christ for his, for his happiness and for his satisfaction. And then Nathan went on to say, the Lord has forgiven you. The first thing we need to understand about our unbelief is that it's already been forgiven. It's already been forgiven by one offering he hath perfected notice hath past tense by one offering hebrews 10:14 he hath perfected them which are sanctified <clears throat> they the thing that helps me most in my unbelief is to know that it's already been it's already been covered by the blood of christ and that and, and 
that causes us to, to, to hate our sin more, doesn't it? It doesn't give us a license to sin. It says to us, Lord, you've loved me that much. You would give me more. You give me more. I need more faith. The disciples ask the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. <clears throat> the disciples in Luke chapter 24, when they were walking with the Lord on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't know it was the Lord. The Lord had holding their eyes so that he had not revealed himself to them yet and uh, and conversing with them he said where have you been they said to him where have you been don't you know that the one that we hoped was the prophet the messiah he's been crucified and he's buried he's dead and what did the lord said to those disciples he said oh fools and slow of heart to believe must not all these things be fulfilled which were spoken by the prophets? <laughs> and then he began to expound unto them from his word the things that were fulfilled that the prophets had spoken. And then in the breaking of bread, he opened their eyes and, and they saw him for who he was. Um, we're just like those disciples, dragging our feet in the dirt, thinking, you know, everything's gone awry and, uh, and just, just not believing God as we ought. <clears throat> Scripture says, whatever is not of faith is sin. The reason we have so much sin in us, because our, our flesh can't believe. And, and, and everything about our, our old man is unbelieving. And, and once we are rid of this flesh, we'll have perfect faith. And with perfect faith, we'll not know sin anymore. What a, what a hope, what a longing that we have for that day. But now, where we are, we, we suffer with this unbelief. Um, when... Peter stepped out of the boat and asked the Lord, said, Lord, bid me to come unto thee. And you remember he began to walk on the water and, and then he looked away from Christ and he looked, the scripture says, to the wind. He was looking at the things the wind was causing, the turbulence of the water, and he began to sink. And he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And uh, uh, the Lord <laughs> did save him and then the Lord said to him oh ye of little faith why did you doubt <laughs> why did you doubt isn't that where we are we walk by faith not by sight and yet as we walk by faith we carry this old man along with us and uh, and he just not able to believe God and we're always you know we 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 can't make a clear distinction in our experience, in our life, between the old man and the new man. We know they both exist, but they, they both affect us, don't they? <laughs> they we, we, so we're, we're, always, we're always saying, Lord, you said nothing doubting, but I'm full of doubts and fears. And uh, Lord, I need some help. And the Lord says, I've got, I've got help for you. I've got help for you. <clears throat> in Mark chapter 4, when the Lord was asleep in the back of the boat, and they were in the midst of a storm again on the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples woke him up and said, Master, carest not that we perish? And the Lord got up, wasn't anxious. He said, Be still. And the wind ceased and that turbulent sea became a placid lake. And they said, what manner of man is this that the winds and the water, the seas, obey his voice? And the Lord said to him, to them, why is it that you are so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And that, is that your experience? You know, we, we just, we wrestle with this thing. We're, we live in a world that doesn't believe God at any point. Nothing about this world believes God. And uh, we're in the world. The Lord's made us to differ from the world. And yet, 
we've got our our flesh in this world that's always prone to wander and always prone to leave the God that we love. As I said, the first thing to remember about our unbelief and all the all the problems that it causes us is that it's already forgiven. It's already t- atoned for. <laughs> and the blessing of that is that grace is the strongest inducement against unbelief that there is. There really is. You know, where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. We could say, you know, we're bringing out all these examples of the unbelief in the, in, the heart, in the lives of the believers. And you read Hebrews chapter 11, and it's clear that, uh, that Hebrews chapter 11 describes those Old Testament believers as they are in Christ. But when you go back and read their life experience, you find out that even with beginning with Abraham, <laughs> Abraham didn't leave or the Chaldees, and the, the scripture, told, the Lord told him, leave your father and your mother. He brought his father with him. Brought his cousin with him. He, he was full of unbelief. And yeah, he's called the father of the faithful. And in, and in Hebrews chapter 11, none of that's mentioned. None of that's mentioned. Why? Because in Christ, in Christ, he had perfect faith. And all that, all that sin and all that unbelief was taken away by virtue of his union with Christ and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what hope we have, brethren. We're not here to, 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 to put people in a guilt trip or shame folks about their unbelief. I'm just stating the truth that we all struggle with it and we need help. We need help in our time of need. And we can come before the throne of grace boldly and, and as I said Sunday, you know, there's a lot of things we ask for we ought not to ask for. And thankfully, our Heavenly Father is merciful and loving and wise to where he knows when to say, no, child, that's not what you need. But there are things we can ask for that we never ask for enough of it. And one of them is faith. Lord, increase our faith. You said nothing doubting. Lord, use, use the means that you've given me and your church to increase my faith. And faith really is the only thing we need. You remember the story of Jairus in Mark chapter 5 when his 12-year-old daughter was on her deathbed and Jairus came to the Lord and pleaded with him to come to his house to, to heal his daughter and and on the way home, the servant showed up and said, Bob of the master, no more. Your daughter's dead. She's died. And what did the Lord say to Jairus? He said, Jairus, be not afraid. <laughs> Only belief. Only belief. <laughs> it's all you need, Jairus. Just believe what? Believe on me. Believe in me. Trust me. Rely on me. And then in John chapter 11, when the Lord um, came to Mary and Martha's house and, and, and the Lord told Martha uh, that, that, that her brother Lazarus would rise from the dead. And, and Martha said, Lord, I know that in, the, that in the last day, my brother will rise from the dead. And the Lord, what did the Lord say? He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then the Lord said, believest thou this? Now you go to Mark chapter, John chapter 11 and read Martha's response. Let's go there real quick. This is so important. This is so important. Did Martha say, Lord, I believe that, that you're going to raise my brother from the dead. Lord, I believe that you're going to do this or you're going to do that. Is that how she expressed her faith? When the Lord asked her, Martha, believest thou this? What did she say? <coughs> Verse 27. She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, 
the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's what I believe. <laughs> and that's what faith is. Faith is not believing that you're saved, or faith is not believing that God's going to do this or do that. Faith is believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the successful Savior of sinners. That's what faith is in a person. It's believing on Christ. And yet we so prone to look away from him, don't we? <clears throat> in our text, back in Acts chapter 11, let's go there. So I want to look at these four things quickly. What has the Lord given us to help us in our unbelief? What has the Lord given us to help us when he said, nothing doubting? Don't doubt me. Don't doubt me. Believe me. Believest thou this? <clears throat> well, the first thing that we see in our text is, is uh, right there in verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. <laughs> and verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. There's the, what the Lord's given us. He's given us the third person of the triune Godhead, the sweet spirit of God. It's the spirit of God that gives us faith to believe. It's the spirit of God that opens the eyes of our understanding. It's the spirit of God that takes out the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. It's the Holy Spirit that, that gives us ears to hear and eyes to see. The Lord told us, he said, he said, it's expedient for you to thy go away. If I go not away, the comforter, the helper, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will not come. But when he comes, he will convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. Do you see that as the root cause of all your problems? Not your circumstances, not, not the world, not somebody else. You know, we live in a culture of victims. Everybody's a victim. And, and I'm convinced that, that there's a, a large class of people that, that create victimization so that they can then become the savior of the victims, thereby establishing their own righteousness. I think it's rooted in self-righteousness. It's what it is. It's, you know, we used to call them bleeding heart liberals. They don't care about... You know, their hearts are not bleeding. <laughs> their motive is to establish their own righteousness. And so they create a bunch of victims so that they can save the victims and thereby save themselves. Uh, and, and that's all it is. It's just rooted in self. Everything is. A, men are self-righteous by nature. And that's our, our bent, isn't it? To be, to be self-righteous and to, to look away. From Christ, But here the Lord said, I've given you my spirit and the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin and cause you to see the root cause of your sin is your unbelief. <laughs> it's what the Lord said. Of righteousness, because I go to my father, you have no righteousness. You can't establish any righteousness. Don't try to, don't try to make some, put somebody else in need so you can save them and become the, you know, become righteous yourself. You, you have no righteousness. You know that. If, you're, if you have the Holy Spirit, how do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Because I know, number one, I'm a sinner. And all my sin is caused by my own unbelief. I have no righteousness except for that righteous one who's seated at the right hand of God. And I believe that he was successful in delivering from the, from the depths of hell all of his people on Calvary's cross. He destroyed the works of the devil. That's what he said. He said, well, convict them of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now, that's what the ministry of, here's, here's our helper, here's our advocate, here's our, here's our paraclete, the one who comes along beside of us and, 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 
and, and helps us in our struggle with sin and unbelief. We have the Spirit of God. Peter had the Holy Spirit speak to him. And then the Holy Spirit manifested his presence when he gave to these, to these people at Cornelius' house gifts. And he's given us those same gifts, the spiritual gifts, that we're not looking for physical manifestations. We're looking for that spiritual gift that enables us to understand the, the, the sounds of God's word and, and to believe him. The Holy Spirit exposes our old man for who he is. You didn't know you had an old man until you got a new man, did you? <laughs> you didn't know it. You, you just were what you were. You were what you'd always been. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came and gave you a new nature in Christ that you could identify that old man for who he was. Before, you thought he was pretty good. And, you know, I, I've had an opportunity the last two days, Trisha and I have talked to a couple people about the gospel, religious people, syrupy religious people. Uh, and, you know, and I walked away from both those conversations thinking, you know, if the Holy Spirit doesn't cause you to doubt your salvation, you'll never come. I mean, you're so confident and it's Jesus this and Jesus that. And they just, you know, acting like everything's wonderful. And, and you know, they didn't know the Lord. You talk to them about things and it's like it was going right over their head. And, they, and they, they would contradict the very things you were saying with something different. And, and, and I thought, bless, you know, it, you've got to have the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't take away that false hope you have, that confidence you have, if he doesn't make you to be lost, you'll never be saved. What a blessing we have. The Holy Spirit causes us to see ourselves for what we are and strips us of all the hope that we had in our own righteousness. And <clears throat> Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll begin reading at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How are we led by the Spirit of God? When the Spirit of God leads someone, where does he lead them to? <laughs> where does he lead them to? He leads them to Christ. He leads them to Calvary's cross. He leads them to, to see that what the Lord Jesus accomplished on Calvary's cross was full satisfaction for sin, full atonement. By the sacrifice of himself, once and for all, he put away our sin. <clears throat> look, at verse, look at verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, what is the spirit of bondage to fear? That's being under the law. You see, faith is just the opposite of works. Faith is looking to Christ for all your justification and all of your righteousness and all of your salvation. Works is trying to contribute something to what the Lord Jesus has done. And, and an honest person, if he thinks that his salvation has anything to do with a decision that he's made or work that he's performed or, or, or anything else. Uh, uh, you know, the lady I was talking to today, you know, she's going all these Bible studies and she thinks she's got so much understanding of the Bible and she doesn't understand anything. And uh, <laughs> she's in bondage, thinking that, you know, well, what, I, what I'm learning is going to help, you know, get me into heaven. No, it's not. But you, have, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. <laughs> what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. That he would adopt us into his family, make us his children. Look at verse 16. The spirit itself 
Don't get hung up on that. The Spirit's a person. But the Lord's, the, the, the Lord's telling us, the Spirit itself, bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit, the Spirit himself, bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God causing us to see. Here's, here's what the Lord's given us for our helper. He's given us his spirit. He said, well, I'm not sure if I have the spirit of God. Well, ask the Lord for it. There's another thing you can ask for that you never can ask too much for or too often for it. Lord, give me your spirit. Not to make a fool out of myself or those people who think they have the spirit of God who don't but that my eyes might be opened and that I might be led in faith to rest all my hope on Christ. <laughs> That's what I need your spirit for. <clears throat> we have a sin that doth so easily beset us. It's the sin of unbelief. And God has given us his spirit to help us first to identify that sin for what it is and to confess it and then to look in faith to Christ for the forgiveness of it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Secondly, go back with me to our text, Hebrews chapter 11. What has the Lord given us to help us in this struggle for faith? The Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting, nothing doubting. Don't doubt, Peter. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. <laughs> There's another thing the Lord's given us. He's given us each other. He's given us each other. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 12 is all about. The Lord gives us that litany of believers out of the Old Testament. And then in chapter 12, he says, seeing then that you are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. <laughs> the Lord did it for them and he can do it for you. And they struggled with faith just like you do. But that's why the Lord gave us that, to, to encourage us. And that's why we have each other. You know, and the fellowship that we have is not just a bunch of fellows in the same ship. Fellowship is, you know, we're, we're, we're in a ship that's headed in the same, we're, we're all going to the same place. <laughs> and we experience the same storms and we have the same captain and we, and we, we depended upon the same wind to fill our sails and we struggle with the same needs and the same problems and what a blessing. The Lord has given us each other. The Lord gave Peter six men to go with him. And six is the number of man. <laughs> and the Lord's given us not just his spirit, but he's given us spirit-filled believers to help us along the way. I'm, I'm, I know there are some believers that, that for one reason or another, I'm not here to make any judgments about that, are not in local assembly. And some of them are listening right now. Um, and my heart goes out to them. What a lonely thing it is to be walking this walk of faith by yourself. To not have a, a gospel church. And uh, to, it, it's a, it, I, I wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> I'm so thankful for you. <laughs> and we're thankful for one another, aren't we? The Lord's given us six men to walk with us, to encourage us along the way. Turn to me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's begin reading in verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know, I thought of a good, a, a good definition for humility. And we know that it's 
looking to Christ. That's the answer to everything. And if we are if we have our affection set on him, we'll be humble. But in, in the practical working out of humility, it seems like to me that humility is taking criticism and responding with, you know, if you knew me for what I was, you'd have a lot worse things to say about me than that. And then on the flip side to that coin, humility is diverting all glory and all praise to God. <laughs> whatever, whatever blessing I have been to you, he's the cause of it. <laughs> whatever blessing you are to me, he's the cause of it. We, yeah, we're not very humble, are we? I'm not. It's hard for me to take criticism and to think that way. I mean, I, my first response is to defend myself. But, oh, if we, could, if we could not do that. And that's what the Lord's saying. Humble, humble yourself. God gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, verse 6, that, ye may, that he may exalt you in due time. <laughs> There's a time of exaltation. When God is pleased to exalt you, he'll do it. In the meantime... Just take the back seat. <laughs> Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfastly in the faith. In the faith. What is it to resist the devil in the faith? It's to look to Christ. It's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to call out for him to increase your faith and to increase your love and your grace and, and your mercy. That's how we resist the devil. That's what the Lord's saying. Steadfastly resist him in the faith, knowing, here's the point I wanted to make, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. These, this struggle with faith is an accomplishment. And every believer that's ever been has been struggling with faith in the same way that you are, in the same way I am. It wasn't for the struggle. We wouldn't find ourselves coming before the throne of grace for help in our time of need, would we? It's just knowing that this, is, this has been accomplished in your brethren, in this room, and in every gospel church, and in every generation. This is the, this is the lot of our life. <laughs> and the Lord says, nothing doubting, and we say, O oh Lord, help thou mine unbelief. And he's given us one another to encourage each other in this walk of faith. That means that when we, when we fellowship, we're fellowshipping around the gospel. <laughs> you know, it's a, what a blessing it is when God's people are able to have conversations about Christ and about the scriptures and about what the Lord's taught them and how the Lord has taught them and how he's blessed them. And just to be able to say, boy, the Lord spoke to me and, and I'm, I'm so thankful for you and I'm thankful for your, I'm not, you're, to one another. One another. That's the, that's the blessing the Lord gave Peter. Gave him his spirit. And he gave him six men to go with him. Thirdly, he gave him a messenger. Look at, uh, look at verse 13 in our text. Hebrews, Acts chapter 11. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. Now you know what an angel is. The word angelos is the word messenger. It's, the, it's, it's just a messenger. It's an emissary. It's one sent of God with the message of the gospel. And in the book of, in the book of uh, Revelation, the seven churches, which represent all the churches of all ages, uh, there are 
there are seven angels and uh, seven stars that are held in the hand of God. And, and, uh, and those, are the, those are the men that God has called out to study and to preach the gospel and to encourage the believers and to point them to Christ. And, and that's what an angel does. He just, he just repeats, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. <laughs> Don't tell me what you think about it, preacher. Tell me what God says. That's what I need to know. That's what you want to know, isn't it? And every time we bring God's word to one another, we're acting as an angel. We're acting as one who has been sent with a message. How can they call upon him in whom they've not believed? And how can they believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher, without an angel, without a messenger? And then what did that angel tell, tell uh, Cornelius to do? He said, go down to Joppa which is the city of Jaffa today at Tel Aviv. And the translation of that city, that name Jaffa or Joppa is the word beautiful. It's a beautiful port city of trade. And, uh, and it's a picture of the church. How beautiful it is. <laughs> how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And, and how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. And, you know, we're, we're that this is this is Joppa. This is that port city. And this is the this is a city of trade We're what are we trading? We're trading our sin and our self-righteousness and our unbelief for that pearl of great price. <laughs> That's what we're doing every time we come together. And uh, and Simon's name. Notice notice in our text in, in verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood the angel stood and spoke and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now, Simon is Simeon, which translated means heard, heard. And Peter is a stone or a rock. Okay, go down to the beautiful city and find someone who has heard from God and they are standing on the rock of ages. They're not going to be moved. They've been fit into the, to the building. They're, they're, they're set on the, on the foundation stone of the Lord Jesus. That's the church. <laughs> so he's given us the church and he's given us one another to help us in this struggle. And he's given us messengers of the gospel to declare Christ and point us, keep pointing us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what you need, isn't it? That's why, you, that's why you're here. That's why we come together. Preacher, point me back to Christ. I'm, I'm, I've taken my eyes. I've gotten, you know, I've got so many other things in this world and I've got this old body of death strapped to me and this flesh and and, and I need to be pointed back to Christ. I need a man who's heard from God to bring a message that will give me a place to stand on a firm rock and fit me into the family of God. That's what the Lord's given us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us six men, one another. He's given us messengers. And notice what else he's given us. Look at verse 14. Who shall tell the words? <laughs> Who shall tell the words? He's given us his word. When the Lord asked the disciples, said, you will leave me also? Lord, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. <laughs> We've got no place else to go to hear the word of God. You know, I, I, I think that article was in our bulletin last Sunday. But I was thinking about, you know, that we have a, maybe I mentioned this Sunday, I can't remember, but we have so many opportunities to hear God's word and to read God's word and and uh, um, 
we need to understand these things are are very unique to our to our time most of the believers of most time didn't even have scriptures of that if they could read they couldn't get a bible and certainly they didn't have cell phones and internet and radio and tv and all those different means by which they could hear the gospel the only time they could hear from god was to assemble together in the church and hear from the angel the messenger of god that was the place how precious was public worship to them i pray it'll be that way for us that we'll come here anticipating a blessing from god pleading with him lord meet with us Meet with us. Speak to us. Give, give your messenger a message <laughs> to my heart. He will tell you words whereby thou may be saved. <laughs> oh, the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, isn't it? It's able to divide asunder, to... to, to expose the thoughts and the intents of the heart and god's word is so glorious turn with me to psalm psalm 19 psalm 19 look at verse 7 the law of the lord and this i'm not talking about just the the Ten Commandments, the moral law. He's talking about the, the canon of Scripture, the Word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect. <laughs> oh, we've got talking heads on TV, and the Scripture says that the writing of books, there is no end. And much study wearies the soul. You know, there, I mean, think about the number of books there are that you can go to and read to, read from, and... and um, and everybody's got a therapist and a counselor and, you know, this person, that person is given that advice and the other advice. And the words are so empty. They're so empty. It's just peace, peace when there is no peace. And God says, my word is perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Look, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. You know, we... We might get some education and enlightenment on knowledge and information when it comes to reading the opinions of men. But what's going to change our hearts? What's going to change our soul? Nothing but the Word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's sure. <laughs> Making wise the simple. Oh, Lord, I'm so simple-minded. I need a simple message. I need a message to be, to be boiled down to the simplicity of Christ. His person and his work as the hope of all my salvation. Or don't, don't give me a bunch of other stuff. You know, religion is very complicated. It's, and it's contradictory. It, it, they'll, they'll say one thing and then say something else. And the word of God is simple. It's pure. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. Lord, I can rejoice when I hear what you have to say. When I hear the gospel, it causes my heart to rejoice. Nothing else causes me to rejoice. Oh, I can get happy or entertained with the words of men, but... Nothing causes me to rejoice in the Lord other than the word of God. Brethren, share your experiences with the Lord with one another. Do that. Don't keep it to yourself. We need each other. This is what, this is what the Lord's given us to help each other. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. <laughs> all scripture has been given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's all profitable, isn't it? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished. Thoroughly furnished. God gives us everything we need in his word. Peter, speak unto them words whereby they may be saved. And he spoke to them of Christ, the living word. For that's what the written word does. The written word reveals the living word. It's all about him. One of the experiences I told Trish and I have with some syrupy religious people was at a Christian bookstore yesterday. We had, uh, we, we went to buy some Bibles. It's hard to find a King James Bible. And then it's hard to find one that doesn't have a bunch of really bad comments in it that, you know, somebody has made down in the footnotes. But it is impossible to find one without red letter in it can't find a King James Bible. I mean, maybe there is some out there. I couldn't find one. We couldn't find one yesterday. So we ended up having to buy some King James Bibles with red letters in them. And the lady said, well, you know, that's the words of Jesus. And I said, well, in the volume of the book, it is written to me. I said, everything in this book is the, word, is the words of Jesus. Well, I know, but that's Jesus speaking. I said, well, he speaks throughout everything in his word. Well, yeah, 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 I know, I know, but you see, when you, when you do that, when you make a red-letter Bible to, to identify, and I know you probably, you might have one, I'm sorry, yeah, that's fine, but don't, don't put extra weight on those words as if the other words of God are less weighty. <laughs> and that's what that does. That tends you, you, when you see the red letter, you think, oh, this is the word of Jesus. It's all the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all his word, and it all carries equal weight. He's given us words <laughs> whereby we might be saved. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Everything in this book speaks of Christ, speaks of him being the Savior of sinners, the successful Savior of sinners. The one to whom we flee and look in our time of need to help us in our unbelief. The Lord's given us his spirit. He's given us one another. He's given us a messenger. And he's given us his word to point us to Christ. Our Heavenly Father, bless your word, we ask. For Christ's sake. Amen. Number 37 in the spiral hymnal. hymnal. Let's stand together. Number 37 in the spiral. <clears throat>